whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tarataru ki tai, e hi ake ana te atākura, he tio, he huka, he hau hu, ti hei mauri ora. Tēnā rā tātou katoa ko hui hui mai, ko hono mai a tinana a hiko rānei ki te whakamana i einei kaupapa. Ki ngā iwi mana whenua o te rohe, ki ngā ti toa rangatira, tarana ki whānui te ati awa, e rere kau ana ngā mihi ki a koutou katoa. Ki a koe e te minita, e te kākā kūra, nau mai haramai, no mātou te honore ko a tai koe mai i tēnei rangi. Ki a koe Gwen korua ko Loretta, ngā mihi nui ki a korua ko a whaiwā ki te whakamana i tēnei kaupapa. Ki a koe e te rangatira ki roto i te ropua kāwai ki te iwi a Maria, ngā mihi nui ki a koe. Ki a aku hoa mahi o te ropu o ngā rātonga kaupapa atawhai me te taritai whenua, nei rā te mihi ki a koutou. He uru kahi kā ki te wao, he uru tangata ki te pā. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora koutou katoa, kia ora rana, halofalava, malolele, namaste, assalamu alaikum, warm greetings to you all for our first fully digital annual meeting. Ko Andrew Newbury, tōku ingoa, my name is Andrew Newbury, I'm the team leader capability here at Ngā Rātonga Kaupapa Atawhai, that's Charity Services, and I'm really lucky to be your MC here today at our digital hui meeting. We had hoped to be joining you all from Tamaki Makaurau in Auckland, but obviously the alert levels don't allow from that. It's really awesome though to see so many people from Auckland here joining us on the call. Our thoughts are with all of you who are in alert level three at the moment. So kia kaha, we hope you're keeping healthy and safe. We also know that this has just been a really busy year for everybody. So we really do appreciate the time that you're taking to come and spend with us today. Before I get into the meeting itself, there's some housekeeping I need to do around how this is gonna run. Even though we can't be here together in person, we still wanted to make sure you had as many opportunities to engage with us as possible. You might have noticed that you won't be able to unmute yourself during the speeches, but there will be a chance for you to chat with others in the sector later on in the breakout rooms. We're also going to ask you to put comments and questions in the chat box throughout. We are monitoring them, 
We're not going to be able to get to every single one of your comments, but we will read them all later. Um, so I promise you they will be read. So we really do encourage you to chuck those in the box and we will be looking at them as much as possible. Please do share your thoughts with us. Obviously with an online meeting does come some potential challenges. So we're hoping that this will all go smoothly, but if it doesn't, if there's any connection issues or anything technical, please just bear with us. We'll do what we can to fix it. And if you do have any issues, you can put that in the chat. Um, if you can't hear me talking right now, then this probably isn't gonna help very much, but um, try turning your sound on or checking your Zoom details because sometimes you have some issues there. Um, the speeches and the Q&A, and in fact, the whole meeting will be recorded. So if you miss anything or something cuts out, you can come back to it later. It'll go up on our website in about a week. So as many of you may know, yesterday was ShakeOut. Um, so we're hoping that we won't have to, but if we do have to use those drop cover hold skills, or if there's any other kind of emergency here in the office, um, obviously we hope you bear with us. Um, if we do have an emergency where we need to leave the building, we'll leave the, the meeting on. Um, we don't expect you to all hang around because we don't know when we'll be able to come back in, but we'll do what we can to keep things running smoothly. So today we're joined by the Minister for the Community and Voluntary Sector, the Honourable Priyanka Radhakrishnan. Two members of Tarata Artify, the Independent Charities Registration Board are also here. Gwen Keel, who's our new board chair, and Loretta Lovell, our newest board member. We also have our Deputy Chief Executive, Maria Robertson, and our General Manager, Mike Stone, with us today. You might have seen in our latest newsletter that Mike just joined us after working in the team that helps to prevent money laundering in Aotearoa. There are a number of people here, also from our policy group, from Hapai Hapori, which is Community Operations, and Charity Services here right now. You'll be meeting some of them a bit later on. And of course, we're joined by all of you. At the moment, we have got, hold on, let me see, about 182 of you in the room. That's, I say kind of, but then I give a very specific number. Um, but that's really exciting for us. It's really cool to be able to see everybody here today. Um, the annual meeting is our opportunity to acknowledge you, the work you do, hear what you have to say, and answer your questions. The advantage of a digital hui is that we can interact with people from across the country at the same time. Obviously, normally we would be in one location, and this means that we can get all of you here together in a room and it really just spreads the whole word out there. Um, so we're really looking forward to this chance to connect with all of you. Thank you for all of your hard work and dedication supporting those in need and building stronger communities. So in a moment, we're gonna open with an address from the minister. Her speech will be followed by ones from Gwen Keel, Maria Robertson and Mike Stone. We'll then send you into breakout rooms with a couple of questions to answer before coming back together for a question and answer session with some of our people. I'll explain a little bit later on how that's gonna work. The plan is to close the meeting at about 12.15. We know that it can get pretty tiring sitting on digital hui all day. So we're not gonna try and keep you for too long. So I asked you, I said earlier that I'd be asking you to pop some thoughts into chat. And we really wanna encourage that throughout. Um, some of our speakers will be asking for that later on. So I really just encourage you constantly to be Pop in your thoughts in chat, it's really useful. Um, but if you could maybe have a think now about what you're most interested in getting out of today's meeting. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot, you know, I'm not, I'm not expecting a novel, but if you wanna just put maybe one or two words about what you're looking forward to today. Personally, I'm really looking forward to hearing what's happening with all of you. Um, these meetings are always a really good chance for us to connect. So yeah, if you wanna put some stuff in chat, um, it's been really awesome to see how many people are joining us here today from all sorts of different organizations um, from places across the country as well. We'll see if anyone has any thoughts about what we might get out of today. Understand it's a little early in the morning. Here we go. Here we've seen some stuff coming through. Looking forward to a broad perspective across the sector, totally. And I think it's really exciting to have so many people here from those different parts of the sector. It means that we're, we're getting a view from all the different kind of um, parts, all the different nuances. Um, I think it's a really good opportunity later on when we'll have some of these breakout rooms where you'll get to chat amongst yourselves, um, where you can maybe meet some people that you wouldn't have come across otherwise. Um, yeah, obviously some inspiring stories. Thanks, Rochelle, that's always really useful. Um, and we're really looking forward to being able to share with you some of the awesome stuff that's happened for us and also for the sector. You know, there's a really good opportunity for us to have a bit of a chat. Connection and understanding. Yeah, 
there will be a lot of that opportunity and a lot of advice. I mean, I think this is where the Q&A session will really come, come to the fore. You know, there is an opportunity for us to have a bit of a chat for you to um, ask your questions of us. Um, obviously, again, it won't be, um, there won't be a verbal opportunity, but there will be, everything will be in the chat and we will be monitoring that. Not gonna get to all of it, but um, it does give us an opportunity to see what kind of questions you have and how we can go away and maybe answer those in more detail. Yeah, nice to hear from, uh, from uh, Wish Trust Waiheke. Awesome to see you all as well. Um, and I suppose a big thing for us at the moment is the sense of connection now that we're you know, a few of us are in different alert levels where maybe we're not able to connect in person. It is really cool that we can be here, we can be talking, you know, connecting digitally. I can't imagine how we would have done this a few years ago, but it's really great that we can all kind of connect up, have these conversations and, you know, be part of a greater whole, the greater sector. What else have we got? Sorry, you will see my eyes dart down as I look at chat, so I will try and get there. Um, Insights and learnings, yeah. Business and community. Yeah, so there's some really awesome, awesome comments in here and people are really interested in a variety of stuff, to be honest. So it's really cool to see and we're getting more and more people popping in all the time. So we're almost at 200 participants, which is great. A little bit intimidating for me, but you know, we'll, we'll get there. Um, yeah, and obviously um, COVID is on people's minds a lot at the moment. So how this is all gonna work and you know, the continued impacts of that. So I'm sure that'll be top of mind for a lot of people, especially those who are you know, currently in an alert level or, or um, having to work with communities who are particularly impacted by COVID. So totally recognize that. Awesome. So we're getting some really cool stuff in there and like really appreciate all of your comments. That's, there will be more opportunities for this. Um, we're going to, I know that there's a few of our speakers who are going to ask for comments. So really do encourage you to keep putting things in the chat. Um, I think though that we will move on for the moment. So I just want to thank everybody for the comments so far. That's been really helpful. And there will be continued opportunities throughout this. Um, but I would now like to invite the Honourable Priyanka Radhakrishnan, Minister for the Community and Voluntary Sector, to address the meeting. Sorry, just having some momentary Zoom hiccups, but we will get there. We will get there momentarily. I'm sure you can appreciate with uh, all the technology, sometimes it doesn't quite do what it's told. Cool, I think we are good to go. Kia ora, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, great, apologies. Um, they kept asking me to unmute myself and then wouldn't let me. <laughs> Um, inga mana, inga reo rauranga tirama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, it is great to be back here at my second Cherry Services AGM. Um, the, the last year when I attended, it was one of the first engagements that I did as a minister. A lot has happened since then and it's, um, it's absolutely wonderful to be back here. As Andrew has said as well, can I just thank you all um, I see now we're at about 195 participants. Can I thank all of you for taking time out to be part of this year's AGM as well? I'd also just like to begin with a few um, acknowledgements and I'd begin with the new chair of Terata Atafai, the Charities Registration Board, Gwen Keel. Gwen was appointed chair of the board in September this year, having been a member of the board since December, 2019. Gwen, thank you for your continued involvement uh, in the charity sector. I also want to specially acknowledge the former chair of the board, um, Roger Holmes Miller, and his commitment to the sector in his role as chair over the past eight years. 
also want to welcome to the board Dr. Bev Gatenby and Loretta Lovell, who was appointed to the board uh, just last month as well, September. Can I also acknowledge from the department Maria Robertson, Dep CE, and Mike Stone, GM of Charity Services. Mike, to you, Andrew, and the rest of your team, can I say a huge thank you? I know a tremendous amount of work has gone into putting this first digital um, AGM hui together. So thank you for that. And it's great to see so many attending today. Now, as of this month, we have just over 28,000 charities across Aotearoa. Um, as Andrew mentioned earlier, it's great to see the diversity of many of you who are attending today both geographically, the communities that you re represent, and the mahi that you are involved in as well. Um, in 2019, individual giving totaled $2.4 billion, the equivalent of 0.76% of our GDP. And while these figures, I feel, are impressive in, in themselves, they don't show how many hours have gone into volunteering and the time commitment to ensuring that our communities are able to flourish and the work that you do to lift the well-being of our people across the country. The number of charities though also indicates how much time, effort and mahi is put in from those in the regulation services as well. So once again, thank you to all of you who are here today. You all contribute in a way that is incredibly powerful to benefit our country. Um, again, just highlighting what Andrew said earlier, these annual meetings are a great opportunity for those in the sector to engage, to come together, even if it's virtually this year, and to connect. And having come from the NGO sector myself, I know just how important that can be, but also how, um, I guess, engrossed in work people get. And sometimes there isn't that opportunity to come to get together to connect with one another. But equally, these meetings are an opportunity for you to hold government to account um, as well. So I am grateful that even given the circumstances, we can come together, reflect on what the sector has achieved through what's been an incredibly challenging year. Um, and a challenging environment as it continues to change. And I see that reflected in some of the um, comments that have been put through the chat screen today as well. But despite all of these challenges, despite the environment, what comes through clearly is the fact that the sector perseveres, consistently supports our communities, that we adapt to what, ha hap what happens, but what continues to happen, um, and find ways to keep connected and to keep giving. The other opportunity for me attending these meetings is to update you on the work that is underway within the charities, uh, the community and voluntary sector portfolio um, that I hold and with a particular focus on the review of the Charities Act as well. So that work to modernise the Charities Act started in 2018 before um, I became Minister. Extensive community consultation took place in 2019, where approximately 1,200 people attended 27 community meetings across the country, and over 360 submissions were received. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic meant that work had to be put on hold. Um, however, that resumed this year with a focus on delivering some really practical operational benefits in this parliamentary term. So during this year, DIA engaged with targeted stakeholders who were identified based on their representation of the sector and knowledge and expertise of the issues and participation in the 2019 consultation. And so that targeted engagement built on the submissions that we received back in 2019. The topics of focus for this piece of work this year include um, those that were highlighted as areas of concern by the sector. Um, for example, the annual reporting requirements for small charities, the role of officers and charities, and the inaccessibility of the current appeals system. So I really want to thank those of you who have contributed to the development of this work over the last few years. Your input has been valuable and continues to be valued throughout this process. I intend to take proposals to Cabinet in the coming weeks. Um, and I'll be able to share a bit more information after Cabinet's made some decisions around that as well. So if Cabinet agrees, I intend to introduce a bill to the House uh, in the new year, 
once introduced, you will once again have the opportunity to submit on the bill as part of the select committee process as well. And so if you haven't already been um, involved in the process, I would encourage you to get involved at that point. Once again, your input and the knowledge of how charities work is incredibly valuable in ensuring that we have a modern and workable charity system. I'm also looking at ways to progress matters that weren't within scope um, of this year's review, but I haven't made any decisions on those yet uh, because my focus has been to progress the work at hand. Just before I end, I want once again to thank you all for your work, uh, particularly over the last 20 months or so, as we continue to grapple with COVID-19 in an ever-changing environment. It's been tough. There have been challenges, and through it all, we've seen the sector adapt and reach out to those who need that additional support. There have also been lessons for us as well. As Minister, my goal is for the government to partner with the sector to be responsive to the on-the-ground needs and aspirations of individual communities and to work in a way that builds social cohesion and that I feel is particularly important given the impact of COVID as well. I want to reduce the administrative and funding burdens experienced by community groups and charities. That's an issue that has been highlighted throughout the pandemic. Reviewing the Charities Act is just one part of that work. There is more. I also want to ensure that communities and organizations are better supported in the way that government funds the sector. Recently, DIA, that of course supports me in my CVS portfolio, completed a review of the community grant funding across both government and philanthropic funding. The review found that the current um, funding system, government funding system lacks cohesion. That makes it difficult for people to know what funding opportunities are out there and also when and how they can apply for that funding. Another key finding was that the current environment doesn't equitably support all aspects of New Zealand society. COVID's also shown us that government funding can be done differently, like providing more flexible funding to meet immediate needs as well. So I'm currently working with officials to develop a new funding framework that will be underpinned by a set of good community funding practice principles, and there'll be more on that as that work progresses. And just finally, I know that COVID has hit volunteering hard. Community organizations that are reliant on, voluntary work, on a voluntary workforce um, have by and large found it difficult to re-engage or to recruit volunteers to the levels that they would like. And we all know that volunteers are crucial to the ongoing recovery of our nation and equally the strength and the health of the sector. So while I'm heartened that collaboration has started, for example, between DIA Volunteering New Zealand and HUIA to understand how community organizations and their volunteers have adapted to the challenges and the opportunities presented by COVID, and that sectors, uh, the sector has started a conversation on that more broadly. That is something that I will be keeping an eye on. Um, and over the next couple of months, my officials will come together with the sector to look at what collaboration and innovation could be taken to reinvigorate volunteering and the volunteering ecosystem as well. So really keen to hear from you on some of your ideas um, and look at how we continue to work collaboratively with you to support the work that you do in, the, in again, an environment that keeps changing. So once again, thank you for the invitation to be here at the um, AGM um, and to share a little bit about the work that we're, we've been undertaking over the last year. Thank you once again for your mahi in ensuring that our communities can flourish, particularly in the face of adverse circumstances. And I look forward to attending next year, hopefully in person. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Toi a mai te wākane, i o e kume a mai te wākane. Ki te tako, ki te tako, tō ranga tako tō ai. Iti, 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 te mana mō tu ake, te tai a te manu e. I, 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 Get 
taco, tite taco, toranga taco, toa, tiri 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 mana motu ake, te tani a te manu, hi hi ha, pi pi fa. Thank you, Minister. It was really interesting to hear about the work to modernise the Charities Act and really awesome that you were able to join us via Zoom. It's really cool what we can do with this technology that we have with, you know, at our fingertips. So I'd now like to introduce Gwen Keel, our newly appointed Chair of Tarata Atafai, to speak about the board, its role and its work over the last year. Take it away, Gwen. Andrew, and katoa. It's great to be able to join with you, albeit remotely, and we're really looking forward to hearing from everyone today. I'd like to introduce you to Te Rata Atapoi and explain its role a little briefly to you. We are an independent three-person board established under the Charities Act 2005 and appointed by the Minister, but we are not subject to direction from the Minister. Sitting with me on the board are Dr. Bev Gatenby, who is a consultant, facilitator and coach, who will be known to many of you with who work in the community and government sectors. Dr. Gatenby was the Chief Executive of Trust Waikato for 10 years, and she's held a range of local, regional and national governance roles. We also welcome Loretta Lovell. Loretta affiliates Rongo Mai Wahini, Ngāti Pauhau Wera, Ngāti Kahanunu, me here. Ms. Lovell is a lawyer and independent environment commissioner. She has advised and been a board member of several iwi Māori and community organisations and holds governance positions on Crown entities and sits on a number of advisory panels to public sector agencies. Ms. Lovell joined us in September this year and no my Heidi, my Loretta. The board would also like to acknowledge and thank Roger Holmes Miller, the past chair, for his outstanding nine year service as the inaugural chair of Te Rata Atawai. Nā mahi nui, Roger. Te Rata Atawai is responsible for all the functions, duties and powers relating to the registration and deregistration of charities under the Act. In practice, we delegate many of our functions and duties to charity services for efficiency, as is required under Section 8 of the Act. To inform our work, we're constantly reviewing the state of charities law, including in overseas jurisdictions. We liaise with sector stakeholders, including our minister, policy teams, sector user group and specialists like the IRD, and we regularly share our feedback and point of view in terms of applying the law. We also provide suggestions and direction to charity service and its educative role, as it provides resources and support for charities and people working in the sector. We make decisions about complex law or novel issues related to the registration and deregistration of charities, including where charities don't agree with the decisions made by charity services under our delegation. In doing so, we must apply the law as it's set out in the Act and is clarified by the courts. And that leads to some robust discussions and considerable complexity due to the state of our current charities law. As many of you will know, the genesis of the Charities Act is in the Statute of Elizabeth. This is an English law from 1601. Aotearoa acquired this English law via the colonisation process. The underpinnings and charitable ethos of that 1601 law substantially survive in the current Act, despite the passage of over 400 years, massive social and economic change, and the emergence of what Justice Joe Williams calls Lex Aotearoa, or the Māori dimension to the modern New Zealand law. This has created a modern divide as sector participants often look now not to just provide aid, but to inform and create transformative social change. And the tension created is illustrated by some recent and key cases in the Supreme Court. Many of these are particularly focused on advocacy, such as Greenpeace, Family First, and the Better Public Media Trust cases. These modern issues are occupying the minds of our highest court and are causing considerable uncertainty in the sector. 
And that leads to really important questions about what it means to be a charity in New Zealand and what a modern charitable law framework could or should look like in modern social and economic setting, especially as we grapple with new initiatives and needed initiatives around housing, economic development, and the expression of mana motahaki. And these things are not always easy to fit under the four PEMS or heads of charity. So what do we think is needed moving forward? We acknowledge the practical and operational reforms that are coming with the Charities Act reform, and we thank everyone for their participation in that process. However, a first principles review is needed. We note that some other important foundational work has been completed, particularly the Trust Act has been refreshed. We now have outcomes from the Tax Working Group. The Incorporated Society Act is undergoing extensive reform, and we are looking forward to a select committee report just next week. And the Law Commission has started reviewing the place and role of tikanga in New Zealand law. We're also due to receive several important Supreme Court judgments. With all of that foundational reform in place, we echo the call of a large number of submitters and stakeholders who have called for a first principles review. The board continues to believe that is necessary. And we hope it will be possible for this kaupapa to be referred to the Law Commission, who may objectively and extensively examine what a modern charitable framework could or should look like or respond to in the modern Aotearoa legal context. I want to thank the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you today and to participate in the kōrero. Nō rera, tēnā koutou, mō te whakarongo mai ki au. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Gwen. It's always really great to hear about the work that Tarata Atawhai does. Um, and we will be joined momentarily by Maria Robertson, but I'll just give her a bit of time to set up. But I, I have been having a little bit of a look at what's in the chat. And uh, I just want to say thank you to that commenter who called us out for our singing ability. Um, it's tough with six of us. So I really appreciate that it went down well. Um, and seen some really good comments in the chat at the moment. And definitely some of the, these questions will be ones that we can cover over in, in the Q&A session if we have the time. So keep on putting those in the chat. And we've got people monitoring that to see what we can what we can answer later on. So perfect, keep on, keep on asking. All right, so next I'll hand over to Maria Robertson to talk about how charity services work fits into the wider context. So Maria leads our branch, Kawaiki Te Iwi, or Service Delivery and Operations. Uh, there are about 900 people in the branch and we're 37, so we are really part of a greater whole. Take it away, Maria. No mai, hara mai, piki mai, taki mai, uh, ko Tararua te monga, ko Kairangi te awa, ko Ngāti Pākia te iwi, ko Bandan te hapu, ko Kaifakahari Matua, ka Waiki te iwi, te Tari Tai Whenua, ko Maria Robertson Tokawengua, nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Well, more than that, everybody, I'd like to acknowledge firstly the Honourable Priyanka Radhakrishnan, the Ministry, the Minister for Community and Voluntary Sector, Gwen Keel, um, who you've just heard for, the Chair of the Independent Charities Registration Board, Loretta Lovell, the newest member of our board, and of course Mike Stone, the General Manager of Charity Services. I also want to join Gwen in acknowledging uh, Roger, who was our long-standing chair who's recently uh, resigned. But mainly, I want to thank you, um, the people who have joined us today for the AGM from far and wide. Uh, for those of you who may be in Tamaki Makoto uh, for the, in the Waikato uh, in particular, um, you know, our, our special mihi to you during our relatively tough times. I want to just talk a little bit about our priorities here at um, in Kawaiki Te Iwi as part of uh, Te Tari Taifina with the Department of Internal Affairs, because these priorities really underpin the whole basis of having real trust and confidence in the charitable sector. And when you think about the number of organisations around New Zealand, it's about 100,000 community organisations, about 28,000 of those are registered charities. When you look at that 100,000 uh, registered or, or entities that are involved in community work, it's about one for every 50 people in our country. So we're actually rich and diverse with community support and our sector here um, in terms of charities plays a really important part of that. It's critical for the public to have trust and confidence in this part of the sector. Our five priorities are really uh, centred around essentially our delivery and our support for the communities, the individuals of whānau that we serve. 
Our first priority is supporting iwi, hapu and communities to lead their own uh, development. And this is particularly critical because I think for government for a long time, uh, we sort of felt that we were the arbiters or the experts really in what was best. And we've seen very strongly that um, actually supporting communities to establish their own aspirations, their own leadership, their own governments, governance is critical to that trust and confidence, but also critical to communities as part of our social infrastructure. We're also really focused on delivering our statutory, regulatory and service excellence every day. And when you're a regulator, as we are in the charity space, actually it's really hard to actually try and balance those things. So we spend a lot of time clearly focused on the service side of this equation. So supporting organisations for good governance, being really clear about their purpose, having good instruments, doing good reporting, engaging with, with their stakeholders. That's where the majority of our effort goes. The pointy end of that is the investigations and sharper regulatory function, but actually all three of those in terms of our statutory, regulatory and service excellence every day are combined within our charity services group to actually support the sector to be really thriving and high functioning. A critical part of this um, and our work also is improving equity of access to public services. What we mean by that is that we don't want to ever be in a position where we are inadvertently creating barriers to people to access as the services that we offer. Um, and that includes in the regulatory side of our equation. So we're always looking at the channels, uh, whether it's our voice channel, whether it's a, a, a digital channel, you know, the work that we've done recently to um, that we're just in the, in the throes of finalising to bring the charity's uh, website uh, into a new cloud-based platform to improve the stability of it, make sure it's actually easier to access, all of that stuff. Because that website, for example, is a massive part of the information that people have, which creates transparency in the sector. Uh, the fourth area that we're really focused on, which you may have seen a little bit of in terms of just heard our, our beautiful songbird, songbirds with the waiata, is creating standout cultural capability to really build on the Māori Crown relationship. This is something that um, across the board we're really working on, and I'm particularly focused on this in terms of my role as leader of this branch mm -hmm. to actually really lift our approach in terms of our understanding uh, and adoption and, and application of Te Ao Māori principles. You know, my own belief and, and part of the privilege when you are a leader of a large uh, organisation like this one is the privileges that you get to make decisions. And one of those decisions has been around our adoption of really good tikanga, of uh, applying Te Ao Māori principles in everything that we do, not just for our Māori staff and Māori customers, Māori organisations, but across the board. You know, our own belief is that if we do that really well um, for our Māori staff, Māori customers, Māori organisations, Māori communities, hapu, if we do that well there, we do it well for everyone. And the final thing is building on our strengths to create a nimble, resilient and engaged workforce. Building on strengths is really important. It's a philosophy that we hold really dearly. Um, uh, you know, and when you think about it, you know, for, in, in many cases, it's easy to become part of a deficiency paradigm, to look at where the gaps are, the faults, the weaknesses. Actually, our organisation is about strengths from the individual and understanding individual strengths profiles right through to the organisations that we work with and serve. So that we're actually building on what comes naturally to organisations and people, as opposed to trying to change them or actually fill in gaps. Um, and when you look at diversity, oops, and diverse strengths, uh, once you do that and you focus on diverse strengths, um, you actually get a, a really strong whole. Now we do this in a number of ways, hopefully you see it. Um, there's a couple of fun things that we do with the team. Um, I've managed to just get word of the day, for example. Um, we, do, uh, we do try and have some fun along the way and also recognise the whole person when they come to work. But again, it's really important. The more we recognise every one of our staff as whole, the better we are able to reflect the communities that we serve. So finally, I just wanted to actually, uh, again, uh, give a shout out to the team. Hopefully that gives you a little sense of what we're about um, in terms of the philosophy that we hold and we bring to our mahi um, and also the, the way that our kai mahi actually engage and connect with you. But finally, I just uh, again want to acknowledge our team, uh, the Independent Charities Registration Board and our minister for the enormous work they do to support the social infrastructure of New Zealand. Nā mihi. Thanks, Maria.
Really interesting to see how charity services fits into the wider department's mahi and really did appreciate the call out of the nine letter target. Um, it was something I was really agonizing about this morning, trying to make sure that I had the anagram right. So definitely if you're into it, we love anagrams around here. Um, so finally, um, we're gonna have Mike join us. So um, Mike is Mike Stone is the general manager of Nā Ratonga Kaupapa Arawhai Charity Services. So he's gonna talk a bit about the work the team have done over the last year and the year ahead. Um, Mike previously worked with us as an investigator. So it's really awesome to have him back with us here today. Take away. Tēnā katoa, thank you, Andrew. Ko uh, kapa kapa nui te maunga, ko waikanai te awa, ka ke kapiti e noho ana ahau, uh, ko Mike Stone, tokawinga. My name is Mike Stone. I'm the current General Manager of Charity Services uh, and a proud Wellingtonian from the Kapiti Coast, as I've said. As some of you will be aware, I'm currently standing in for Natasha Waite, uh, while she is the General Manager in another area in Te Tari Tai Whenua. And it is really my pleasure to return uh, to a homecomings of sorts uh, as I started in Te Tari Tai Whenua and Charity Services and Investigator, as Andrew said, in 2015. More recently, my time is spent here leading the department's anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism group, and also helping with the department's COVID-19 response team. As others have done, I'd like to lead off with a few thank yous before I talk about some uh, important elements of our work. So on behalf of the charity services team, thank you all for being here today and participating in our first digital annual meeting. That's quite an event for us and we're very proud to be able to provide this offering to you. It's my specific thanks and the team's thanks to Minister Radhakrishnan for your taking time with us today and speaking and being available for this important event. My thanks also to, to, to Gwen Keel, the Chair of the Charities Registration Board, and our Deputy Chief Executive, Maria Robinson, who you've just met, for their time, your ongoing support, and your contribution to this online meeting. I'd also like to acknowledge Loretta Lovell, the newest member of the board, uh, joining us today, and Dr Bev Gatenby, the third member of the Charities Board, who unfortunately isn't able to be with us today. Lastly, a big thank you to you, the charitable sector, you have faced a range of enormous challenges over the last few years. You have responded quickly and creatively, offering the generosity and kindness that communities need in times of hardship in such unique circumstance. Thank you for the essential support you continue to provide communities across Aotearoa. I'd like to emphasize that this meeting is for all of us. It's about charity services showcasing some of the work we are doing but more importantly for us, it's about hearing from you and how we can better support you. And as Andrew has emphasized, we are using the chat feature. And I had set myself this task of getting you engaged in that chat feature. I had some questions prepared, but you know what? I'm not going to use them because I've seen you're using it amazingly well. And there really isn't a need for me to ask that question to stimulate that chat. So please keep that up. I encourage you to use it uh, constructively. Give us your thoughts and feedback. And we're really interested in some creative ideas about what you think we could be doing better or differently. Let me just talk about the annual review. So I'm really pleased uh, in my role here to highlight our annual review for the 2021 financial year to you all. And you can find a link to that in the attendee pack you received before this meeting. The annual review outlines the things we've done and the things we're planning to do to contribute to our vision of being well-governed, transparent, and a thriving charitable sector with strong public support. You will have also received a charity services on a page document that is a visual representation of who we are and how we function. I hope when you look at that, 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 that it provides you with a useful visual summary of the functional areas of charity services and how we interact together. As our annual review explains, to achieve our vision, we focus on being risk-based and as responsive as we can be. We work to try and understand the challenges that entities face and support them in the areas as best we can, whilst also taking a firm hand and firm action where we think we need to. Our preferred approach is always to educate and to support charities to address the issues and remain registered. We want to help those of you who are doing the right thing and those of you who want to do the right thing, but maybe I haven't quite got the skills or the knowledge to do the best that you can. But we also understand that there are some out there who don't want to do the right thing. And it's important that we act when required and when the public expects us to. 
Our investigation team uses a risk-based approach to ensure that any charities that aren't doing the right thing don't adversely impact public trust and confidence in the sector. We are currently reviewing how we manage complaints about charities so we can be more efficient, we can be more effective, and we can focus our attention to the areas of the greatest risk. We know that's what you expect of us. This will ensure we continue to deliver results that enhance that trust in the sector. Let me talk briefly about people's favorite topic, uh, annual reporting. So uh, we are continuing to try and make annual reporting as easy as it can be. We know it can be complex uh, and we are working hard at ways to make that better for you. Quality and timely reporting is important for the success of individual charities, but also for the reputation of the entire sector. It helps ensure transparency, so the public know about the work you're all doing and are more, more willing to support you in that work. One of the initiatives we are doing to help making reporting easier, and we've tried uh, in this new COVID world, is one-on-one -on -one clinics. Um, charities can book in some time with us to chat about specific questions because we understand that retaining and having face-to-face -face and personalised contact is important for you and it's important for us too. Since introducing these clinics, our staff have met one-on-one -on -one with 228 different charities to help them better understand their reporting obligations and provide advice on a whole range of issues and questions. We also continue to try and release clear and simple language resources and guidance to help smaller charities to report, such as checklists and your reporting timelines, so that you know what to re report, what to prepare and when. And we're now working with the external reporting board on making a much simpler performance report template for smaller charities. And this will free up time and resource in those small charities. Look, we can continue to observe and see your amazing work. And we continue to see all the hard work you are, you're putting in to try and do the right thing. And we acknowledge that. And we have seen some improvements in reporting. Our latest data shows high rates of reporting in larger charities, 96% in tier one, and 100% in tier two charities reporting correctly, which is amazing. I'm also really glad to see a small but significant improvement in tier, uh, tier three and four charities. 97% of tier three charities reporting correctly, up from 94% last year. Amazing number. 61% of tier four charities are reporting correctly. Look, that's not where we'd like it to be, but importantly, it is an increase of 59, from 59% last year. So we recognize we've got a little bit of work to do to help lift this. Moving away from reporting, I'll touch on Takatai Whenua work and our engagement with charities supporting ethnic communities. And Maria mentioned how important this work is to us all. Titari Tai Whenua remains committed to its work with charities that have a Te Ao Māori uh, focus. We strive to be effective in supporting Māori charities in the mahi they do across Fano, Hapu Iwi and Hapori in Aotearoa. Our Te Puna Atawhaitanga pages are one way we support Māori charities. These pages are a section on our website that provides specific guidance for charities with a kaupapa Māori focus. If you haven't seen those, I encourage you to go take a look. Since publishing these pages, we've been seeking feedback on what else we can also do to include, uh, to further support those Māori charities. Soon, we'll be publishing a new page to help charities report on receiving and gifting koha in their performance reports. And this year, we'll focus on seeking feedback on how we can improve our engagement with Māori. And once again, I welcome your feedback uh, through the chat and through the breakout sessions. We absolutely remain committed to education and engagement as key ways to lift public trust and confidence. And this year, we plan on delivering several engagements, including workshops tailored to charities that support Pacific and ethnic communities. Those engagements aim to provide information, education regarding registration, annual reporting and governance. And we'll also continue our cooperation across government to ensure that other supporting agencies are involved in the work where we all see that's appropriate. And we'll continue uh, to provide a, a program of creating simple guidance translated for those who don't have English as a first language. One last request before I close and you move out into the breakout rooms. I want to emphasize our genuine desire to listen, to listen to you, to hear your voice and to understand if you think we're heading in the right direction. Please think about those practical, constructive and realistic ideas. And what can we do to support you better? What would make your job easier? In closing, thank you for attending this meeting and for the work you do in your communities. 
your mahi supports some of Aotearoa's most vulnerable communities that may not receive the support they otherwise need. I'd just like to specifically thank the Charities Services team. You are a great bunch of people. I'm very proud uh, to be able to lead you at the moment. You are passionate about the work that you do uh, and the work you do uh, creates great value for all of New Zealanders. Thank you for your ability, your hard work and your dedication during these challenging times. Lastly, I hope everyone gets value out of this first digital annual meeting. Please all stay safe and well, look after yourselves, your friends, family and loved ones. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks, Mike. Uh, just wanted to really support Mike's comments there about um, resources and what we can do to help more. My team is responsible for developing a lot of these resources and putting them on the website. So if there is anything that you feel is a bit of a gap that you want more information on, really do encourage you to get in touch. We're always happy to get new ideas and to do things that can help support the charitable sector. So um, I'd now like to explain how our next session, which is the breakout rooms and the Q&A is gonna work. It's a little bit of technical information, so just try and kind of bear with us, um, but we'll try and make it as easy for you as we possibly can. So in a couple of minutes, we're gonna send all of you off into a breakout room and you'll be there for about 15 minutes all up. Um, some of you will have used breakout rooms on Zoom before, but in case you haven't, I'll explain how that's gonna work here. So you should get a pop-up on your screen inviting you to join a room. You just need to click join breakout room and you're away. Um, we've got two questions that we want you to discuss. Don't worry about trying to remember them. So um, one of our team members is going to put those into the chat shortly before we go away for these breakout rooms. Um, but what they are for your information is the first is what questions do you have for us? So that's really just an opportunity for you to think about the questions maybe that you want to put through in the Q&A. Um, the second of those is what opportunities do you see for the charitable sector over the next 12 months? And what part do you see charity services playing in that? Again, those will be in the chat, so don't worry too much. That second one is a little bit on the longer side. I'm sure there'll be plenty of great ideas being discussed and we would love to record them, but we're not recording the breakout rooms. So in each breakout room, can the person whose name comes first alphabetically, so if I was in a room, it would probably be me, um, can they please take notes? Once you're all back in the room with me, I'll ask those note takers to copy paste that directly into the chat. Um, that, not all of that is going to get addressed immediately, but it will give us a really rich source of information to do some really good mahi going on. Um, some of our staff will be roaming through the breakout rooms for the first half of the session. They may not make it into your room, but you know, just so you know, if someone pops in with DIA in their name, they are meant to be there. Um, so they're going to be looking to source a bit of information about the questions you have for us. They'll be taking notes of any questions that you have so that they can discuss it in the Q&A session later and give a bit of a summary of what they heard. Um, they're not gonna have a chance to get around all of the groups. So again, um, we, we'll do what we can, um, but just make sure that you take good notes of your questions as well. We may have time to come back to any additional questions you have later. So, you know, keep putting them in the chat, keep on asking and we'll, we'll see what we can get to. Um, to allow for an open discussion of the second question, our people are gonna come back and so you can have a much more well-rounded discussion about what, what you've seen in the sector. As the breakout rooms wind up, you'll get another pop-up on screen and that'll have a timer asking you to come back to the main room. That really just gives you a chance to, you know, say goodbye to the people you've been chatting to, um, you know, wrap up your conversations and prepare to come back into this room. You can click leave immediately if you want to, but I'm sure you'll want to stick around and chat with the people you've been talking with already. So, um, some of the people that you'll see in there, there's information about all of us in the program um, that we include in your attendee pack. And I would encourage you to have a look at the information in that attendee pack. There's, there's quite a lot of detail in there. Um, so if we have time at the end of the Q&A session, we will open up to any questions that have been posted in the chat um, that haven't been answered already. So we won't have time to get to everything, but like I said, we will be reading all of this later on. We will be reflecting on it and we will be making sure that it is incorporated into the work that we do going forward. So with that, we're about to send you off into your breakout rooms. And if you get stuck, I'll be here. So hopefully that fills you with a bit of confidence, but yeah, we'll be fine. So welcome back. I hope you all had a really great discussion. Um, and can I please ask the note takers, as I said before, to paste anything, copy and paste their notes into the chat. Um, as I said again earlier, we're not gonna get to everything 
right this moment um, because there will be quite a lot and because it's quite hard for me to read from down here. But um, we will we will look at it all later. So please rest assured that all of this is going to go towards um, our planning for the next year. Um, you can also email anything through to events at charities.govt.nz and we can look at it there. So whatever works best for you, really. Um, either way, we'll have a look at it. So I can see, even though I can't read the comments, I can see the comments coming through because they're popping off on the, on the side of the screen. So it's really awesome that everyone had such a great chat. Um, anyway, let's kick off into the Q&A session. Um, before I do anything too much, I just want to give a quick little introduction to the people we've got with us so you know who you're dealing with. So obviously you've met Joe already, who delivered the Mihi Whakato earlier. Um, we have Maria, we have Mike, and then in Zoom land, we have a few other people. So I will just make sure, checking my list to make sure I've actually got everybody because I don't want to miss someone off and then they'll get mad at me afterwards. Um, so we have Andrew, great name, in one of our Zoom rooms. Um, Stephen is also with Andrew. James Lathan is Zooming in from home, so that's really awesome. Uh, Alyssa, Sela, and Louise are all with us today. So thank you all for joining us. and. This covers a, a pretty wide range of the potential questions that we could get asked. So we've got, we've got the A team here, I'd say. Um, so without further ado, I just want to pass off to Mike because he was telling me before that he had some really interesting discussion in his breakout rooms. So Mike, do you want to give us a bit of a summary maybe? Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I did actually. It was, it was tough to pull myself away from the conversation, to be honest. Um, so uh, thank you to the, to the people that spoke in the, in the breakout room. Um, I won't identify you, uh, but it, it was really interesting for me from a fresh, uh, fresh perspective and a fresh set of eyes, uh, and that's how I led off our breakout room because um, I really wanted so, uh, some honest feedback and reflection, and I think I got that. It was a real mood of the room type, uh, mood of the of the sector conversation, but uh, differing uh, perspectives from those that were in different sectors. But I think uh, some of the notes I took down is that. Um, there was some uh, thoughts that we could communicate to the tiers of charities a little better. So thinking about how we communicate to those very small uh, charities, as well as those very large ones, which made some very uh, logical sense to me. Um, and um, how do you tailor a message to a grassroots, a very small charity, and also to a large complex one uh, with the same intent. And that's a continual challenge we have with our guidance, I think, across all our regulatory regimes. Um, we spoke about the website. Uh, and it working for some, but not for others, um, but specifically about it uh, in two ways, which was, could it be a vehicle or a mechanism for networking and connection uh, between charities? So could we uh, make a feature or a focus on that that created a forum or some way of, of people reaching out, which I thought was an interesting idea, um, and also uh, accessibility across the range of online information. So um, is there an assumption that because we put it on the website, it's accessible, mm -hmm. um, or is it that we need to tailor how we put it on the website, how we make it more user friendly for a range of audiences? So um, that's a quick summary of, of the room. Uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you to the people that were participating. Absolutely. And accessibility is something that's really important for us and something that we're actually working on at the moment. So within my team, we've been thinking about this for quite a while. We know that some of the information and the way that it's presented on the website doesn't meet everybody's needs. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is working with one of the other teams in Kawaii Iwi, who are our content team, and they're supporting us in developing a much more um, user-friendly version of the website, which meets some of those accessibility standards. The content is written in a way that makes sense to people and that it is presented in a way that's logical. So that if you look at the website, you go, oh yeah, I understand where that fits rather than kind of getting lost. So that is definitely something we're really looking to do. Um, I want to make sure that we include our colleagues in the other room. So I would like to pass off maybe to Andrew and see if he has any summary of the room that he was in. We'll get there eventually. Sorry, I promise. Classic, uh, yeah. <laughs> classic unmuting challenges. Um, yeah. So I think I was, um, I, I had the experience of quite a few people on the call that I didn't have many people in my room. So I jumped in with a few, some of the things that um, people talked about were challenges with audits. Um, and that's something we have heard a lot that um, finding audits at the moment is reasonably tricky for charities. 
um, and and finding good auditors is is tricky for charities. Um, so we're well, um, the, the professional bodies that are responsible for auditing in New Zealand are very aware of this problem um, and are working on it. Um, but we're also aware. So if, if any of your charities are having issues in that space, definitely get in touch before you file your annual return and let us know so we can talk about extensions and things like that. Um, yeah, that, that was me. I don't know if anyone else in the room um, wanted to convey any things in their breakout rooms. I think, um, so thanks to Paul and Francois who are in my breakout group room for talking about the, um, the funding issue, in particular um, how, difficult to, how difficult that's been in sort of the COVID-19 environment. So, um, so just around the support they could get for funding, I don't know whether Maria wants to sort of touch on the funding because she has a broad responsibility within the department, but you know it's something that we're really acutely aware of, uh, the funding challenges for um, many in our sector. I'm happy to. Um, thanks, Stephen. And, uh, and it is, you know, it is an ongoing uh, challenge. So I guess to give people a bit of a sense of the landscape. So uh, across the board, uh, Te Tari Tai Whenua oversees um, around about $650 million of uh, grants and funding that actually comes through uh, class four gambling activities, lotteries, uh, profits, um, the community organisation and uh, grant scheme and a number of other sort of smaller funds. And these tend to be oversubscribed, as you'll appreciate. We've done a, a lot of work uh, in the last few months looking at uh, and going back to that uh, equity of access to public services question, we've done a lot of work to really analyze and look at the funding landscape and, uh, and, and do a couple of things. The first is to understand uh, what is meant by grants and funding generally. Uh, the second is to look at the sources of grants and funding, and that's a mix of sort of philanthropics, uh, donations, crown funds, um, as I said, proceeds of gambling and other things. The third then is the mechanisms by which uh, those funds and grants are accessed and by whom. And the fourth is, um, you know, how do you make that actually a, a better exercise? In reality, um, as many of you will know, um, often larger organisations are much better set up to actually take advantage of grants and funding uh, avenues that are available. They tend to have the resources to be able to spend time and effort putting together almost as a dedicated discipline, um, grants and funding applications. And some of our, our, uh, our evidence suggests that the very small, a very small few number of large charities actually receive um, you know, a, a, a massive uh, amount of, in terms of proportion of grants and funding that's available. So it's a sort of a self-fulfilling issue. We're doing some work now and, and, um, and supporting uh, the minister to actually look at uh, better approaches to grants and funding. And, and it's not just uh, grants and funding in terms of applications for grants to do certain things, whether it's um, support uh, for uh, the administrative roles that many of you have or particular working communities. Uh, it could be for leadership development or uh, youth schemes, all sorts of different things. Um, but it's also looking and working with colleagues and other agencies to understand grants and funding as a bunch of activities. So for example, um, many organizations receive grants, but they're almost in the form of a contract for service provision. So if you think about um, Ministry of Social Development, health providers, a number of those, they actually receive what are called grants in return for delivery of services almost on the Crown or government's behalf into communities. In DIA, we actually have grants and funding that's purely for the community's sake, not for a contract for service type model. And, and a big thing that we're looking at is to say, how is that actually best distributed? What are the mechanisms that we can use to actually avoid some of the bureaucratic burden, the, 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 admit, the admin burden that most organisations go through to access very small amounts of funding? And I'd expect in the next... Uh, six to 12 months, we'll make massive progress in actually redefining the system of grants and funding that we use, but also supporting our, our colleague agencies to do the same. It doesn't solve the problem of a finite amount, but it actually, we hope, will provide a more equitable, equitable pathway for organisations to apply and receive and you know, um, be granted um, funding uh, through the sources that we have. 
Awesome. Thanks for that, Maria. That was really good. Um, so uh, one thing that I I forgot to mention earlier, but um, it's in response to some of the questions that we have seen coming through. So just to be really clear that um, we're not in a position where we can answer queries about specific name charities. Um, so we can answer general questions, but if anything does come up where you're wanting to know about a specific case or something that's happening, um, we really, this isn't the forum for it. But absolutely, if you want to get in touch with us um, directly about any concerns you might have, you know, via email, we have our compliance team, the investigations team will we'll look into it. So just want to make that really clear so that we're not, you know, setting the wrong expectation for you. Um, so we've had quite a few questions coming in, unsurprisingly. Um, one of the ones that I think maybe Andrew might want to talk about a bit, I can, I can lead into it a little bit, but was just around, um, obviously, a number of charities have been affected by COVID in terms of the, their ability to run meetings or their you know, statutory obligations in terms of AGMs and just whether there's any guidance available. Um, so Andrew, maybe you want to give a little comment on that? He's unmuting. Yes, I think, I'm, I think we're off mute. Um, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a question we get um, a lot. I'd say it's one of the most common questions we've had recently through our inbox as well. So this is a question we get a lot. So we do have some information on our website about this. Um, and uh, the, the basic guidance um, is to abide by public health guidelines. Abide, um, so if, if you're in a level three area, obviously for a lot of you running an in-person AGM won't be possible. Um, and that's, that's okay. We're, certainly from charity services perspective, there's gonna be no issue with you um, having to not run an, um, an AGM if you're complying with um, health guidelines. The um, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment has been making changes to um, incorporate societies and trusts and companies legislation so that you can make changes to your constitution much easier um, electronically. Um, now that, um, the last time I checked, that, that, um, that legislation was still making its way through the House, but that should be soon in place. It was in place in the previous lockdown. Um, it expired in April, um, but it will soon be back in place to allow you to make simple little changes to your rules documents, to allow you to meet, um, meet electronically a lot easier. Um, we've recently um, published a blog that um, explains, uh, um, ex um, encourages you to really look at your rules documents and, and think about making it a lot more um, resilient to these kind of changes by introducing the ability to have electronic meetings, both um, annual meetings and um, regular trustee meetings um, on an ongoing basis, because this allows you to operate in these kind of scenarios. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. And um, I'll put one to someone else so it's not just Andrew and I putting questions to each other because, I mean, it's a great name, but it's not that great. Um, so we've had quite a few questions, unsurprisingly, about um, reporting and, and tier four reporting in particular. Um, so Alyssa, I'm hoping you can give us just a little bit of context around, we've had a lot of questions about the difficulty of tier four reporting and how that's quite a burden for them. Um, so why do they have to do it and, and what does that kind of add? Sure. So I think we are a mute. Awesome. Um, so I guess kind of the first thought is we think that reporting for all charities currently is, makes it more transparent and accountable to the public. So ensuring that your information is accessible to anyone who does want to donate to you, to help you out, um, to fund you as well. Uh, we understand that tier four reporting can be quite onerous for some people. And that's when we're working with, you know, the XRB, so the External Reporting Board, who create these standards in the first place. So we worked with them on the tier three and tier four review recently, and we provided some submission around ensuring this is keeping on the simple, simple side of things. Um, we're also working with them currently on a very small two to three page tier four report that you can do instead of all the pages. Um, and hopefully that will mean a little bit simpler for that reporting. Um, the other thing that we're doing at Charity Services is we understand, I think, as Mike's already mentioned, that low level of compliance, we are quite concerned about it and we're trying to constantly work towards improving that. So we're creating resources. I've done a couple of webinars and we're always interested to hear if there's something you are struggling with in particular, let us know and maybe we can write a resource. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it's going and I think it's quite important that you are reporting. Oh yeah, and I also do one on clinics every Thursday, so I feel like a lot of people come um, through those with tier four reporting questions, and that's those 
that conversation that I can have, obviously not in a situation like this, but just 20 minutes of talking to someone, work, working through those questions that they have, going through the template if they have any questions, um, and then they have my email address to be sending up those questions through. Like, And that one-on-one, -on -one, I think people find that once they've talked through it, that's where they kind of get that clarity. And once you've done it once, it's that simplicity of, I've already done it and I can do it again. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Alyssa. I might pass one to Joe now. Okay. Don't want to leave you out, mate. So <laughs> make sure you get some. Um, so one of the questions that we've had is around um, why did you make more decisions last year than you received applications? Right, good question. Um, so it's quite a short answer, though, really. <laughs> Sorry, um, short answers. <laughs> good, we just um, we worked through last year some decisions, uh, some applications that had been made the previous year and we worked through those last year. So that's why we made more decisions last year than we received applications. Okay. Yeah. That, that was a short answer, but it was <laughs> nice nice and tight, mate. I appreciate it. Awesome. Um, and maybe some for James um, in, in Zoom land. So nice to see you with us, James. Um, so can you talk us a bit through like the complaints and so how many complaints we're receiving every year and what those look like? Yeah, sure. So um, we received uh, last financial year, we received approximately 222 complaints. Mm -hmm. So each one of those complaints goes through. Um, it's assessed individually. Um, we take a risk based approach to all our complaints against our compliance approach. Um, with those, a certain amount will end up going to an investigation. With others, we might refer to a different agency, or we might provide some education or guidance to the charity. Um, we're really keen on improving governance. So if we can provide advice or resources, we try to do that as well. Okay. Thanks, James. So a couple of questions that we've had coming through is about the size of the sector. And obviously we've acknowledged that we've got 28,000 odd charities at the moment, which is, you know, it's big. So it's, it's a lot of charities in Aotearoa. Um, so Andrew, I might send this one off to Stephen and you. Um, so if, if you two want to have a bit of a talk about it, but um, you know, what, what do we do about the number of charities in Aotearoa? Is it right? What, what's our space there? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I suppose I mean, it, it's fair to say there are, we've got more charities per capita than um, other comparable countries. So that, that is something, and we definitely hear about um, the duplication in the sector. We hear things about that, but a really important thing to remember is if a, if a charity applies and it qualifies, we register it. That's, that's the law. That's, that's what the Charities Act says. And there is something to be said for the diversity and the variety of, um, of effort that the charitable sector puts in. We see that coming through in annual returns every year. And I think um, there, there's definitely something in that duplication space, but there's also something in the variety space. I don't know if you've got anything. Uh, no, that's actually um, a comment that I saw in the chat from Richard earlier and in the breakout room, I was also in with Richard that, you know, this, this duplication of effort uh, costs and governance and effort. Um, but I, I guess one, one light touch thing we do when we receive an application is we ask the applicant, well, have you checked the register to see if there is someone else doing this in your area that you could sort of join forces with rather than creating a new charity? Um, but as, um, as Andrew says, um, people are very um, uh, interested in doing their bit for their community. And if they feel that the formula charity is the best way to go, well, then provided they comply, they get registered. I've actually looked into this as well. And, uh, and because, you know, obviously, uh, as you said earlier, Andrew, you know, it's 37 um, souls who are, who are part of the charity services uh, group, but, uh, you know, there's a bit more access to some of the wider um, infrastructure that we have in, in the branch. But uh, I do look at it occasionally and think about um, what does that mean in practice? When you're, when you're spreading, uh, the organisation over an ever-increasing number of, of organisations. And you put that into the mix with other community organisations. I talked earlier about the fact there's around about 100,000 uh, community organisations in this country, NGOs, registered charities, uh, 
other charities because anything can call itself a charity. Uh, so it's about one for every 50 people. And you kind of look at that and you go, you know, is that sustainable? And I do think this is an important question that's not one for an organisation like ours to answer. Because as, as, you know, other Andrew, we'll call him other Andrew, <laughs> as, as he's just said, you know, there's something to be said for the diversity of the sector. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said for that. But when we look at um, our budgets and funding and that sort of stuff, you know, Mike and I have just done a little bit of maths. And the reality is that um, you know, the amount of kind of funding that's available to support the sector uh, for all sorts of good reasons, you know, when you start, you know, the more you spread that, the, the kind of the lighter the touch. And uh, I think it's sitting at about $243 per entity now. Uh, four or five years ago, it was 250 So it's not much when you start to look at it, but you kind of, that's just on the kind of the revenue side of the equation. But as, as people will know themselves, you know, our, the inquiries go up, the amount of support when you do change goes up. I think we're up at, you know, thousands and thousands of queries that come into the organisation. So whilst we don't want to actively discourage anybody, we also, I think, you know, the whole community also needs to be aware of the downside and the risks of sort of trying to spread the resources that we have across the country whether it be locally or nationally, uh, spreading those too thin, uh, you know, can have an unintended consequence of, of just not being able to achieve the purposes that, that people are setting out to achieve. Awesome, thank you. Um, and actually one, one question that we've been a little bit in, or sort of a, a comment and then a question is just around um, people really appreciating the one-on-one -on -one assistance that we provide. You know, people have called out specifically, uh, Lissa, the reporting, uh, the financial reporting clinics. So, that's pretty great feedback to get on a, a live annual meeting stream. Um, but there has been a question about whether there's a, a funding version of that. And I, I, we do work with our colleagues in Hapai Hapuri Community Operations to also run funding clinics where appropriate. And in fact, they are um, their offices are spread throughout Aotearoa. They have offices all throughout the country. And they are available to meet with you, to talk with you, and to, to go over those funding options that are available. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier about one of our priorities being about, you know, um, uh, HAPU and community-led development. And uh, so, you know, as Andrew said, we have uh, in our Harpai Harpori area, we have, you know, 16 different locations where people are not only working with communities, they're living in part of the communities that we serve. Um, with a massive network of community advisors. And they spend a lot of time um, out and about, always out and about, uh, working with organisations around what are their funding structures look like? How is their governance? You know, not just the, the legal structures they're working in with, but how are they working? And what are the access to, um, to not just crown funds that might be available, but also other trusts and other things where there may be funding available for particular causes. So, you know, I do encourage people to get in touch with those um, parts of DIA. Um, as always, you know, um, there's a clue in the title, public servant. We take that really seriously in terms of supporting and serving the communities that we're part of. So, you know, if people do have questions about the grants and funding side of, uh, of what they're trying to achieve, then definitely look up your local DIA office and get in touch. Awesome, thank you. And um, I've seen one come through, and this is, I guess, a continuation, James, of what you were saying earlier about being more of a, we try and educate where we can. But someone has asked, you know, how often do we actually deregister due to non-compliance? So in terms of investigation-wise, um, there would be approximately one deregistration due to serious wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. um, each year. However, there would be, and I don't have the figures for this, quite a number of charities that would be deregistered for not complying with the reporting standards, for not filing their annual returns. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Andrew Phillips or somebody might be able yeah. to have those figures available. We can pass it, Andrew. Yeah, um, yeah we've got, um, so in the, in the last year, we um, 782 charities deregistered altogether, um, and 396 of those were because they failed to file annual returns. 
um, and 385 of those were because they voluntarily um, deregistered, which often happens when we remind them that their annual returns are due and they decide that they don't want to become um, registered charities anymore. So that's, that is, um, historically, that's the most, um, it's about, across the whole history of the register, it's about 50-50 between failing to file annual returns and voluntarily, de um, and voluntarily jumping from the register. Um, the amount of charities that actually deregistered for that serious wrongdoing is very, it's a very small proportion and all. We, we do tend to focus on the, the education, um, the education side of things and try and work with the charity to improve their governance before we take those more serious steps. And just, I'd just like to remind the meeting that um, the registration and deregistration uh, responsibility is actually uh, with the charity's registration board to run to Artify. And you heard from Gwen earlier. So uh, a lot of a lot of the stuff we do under the board's um, guidance and delegation. But when a charity is deregistered, that that's usually um, for serious wrongdoing, for example, that would be um, a decision of the board at a board meeting. Awesome, thank you. So I'm just having. I'm just having a bit of a look and we are coming to the, the close of our time, but we'll see if we can get a couple more questions in before we before we wrap up. Um, but, so there's quite a few questions. So it's just working out the best ones to ask because there are so many of them. Um, this one might be maybe, I'll pass to Joe initially, see how we go and we can always kick it around the room to see how we go. But, um, you know, a lot of charities are looking how do they get set up and how do they, you know, write a constitution or like where are the resources? What can they do to do that? Obviously, we don't provide that advice directly, right? But can you maybe talk a bit about how that works for, for a new entity wanting to set up? Um, yeah, in terms of a new entity wanting to, to set up, I guess the first thing uh, you want to be thinking about is the entity um, type. Um, and I think we do have some resources available. So on our website, around entity type yeah we do um and we did a webinar on that as well um and once you've decided on that then you want to be deciding um who your officers would be so for example if it's a trust you decide to set up then you'll be uh, working out who the trustees are going to be um and then well obviously i guess before all of this you want to work out what your purpose is before you get on to your entity type um, and then you just need to make sure that you have your purpose really well set out in your in your document and your trust deed. Um, there are example trustees. I think we do have an tr example trustee on our website. Um, and there's also other resources available at Community Net um, Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. um, and one, once that's all in place, you, you want to have um, worked out as well what sort of activities you're going to be carrying out. Um, and then you can submit an application to us. As well, we provide, um, we're able to provide pre-application advice. So if you're a bit unsure about um, your purpose or whether your plans, whether they're gonna be charitable, for example, you can get in touch with us and we can provide that um, advice before you submit a formal application. Thanks, Thanks Joe. And now we're on to our last question. So um, thank you for all the ones that have come through chat. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to get to every single one, but they've been really, really good questions. So thank you. Um, the last question I have is, again, uh, sending us back into Zoom land. So um, Andrew, I understand that there's a pretty significant piece of um, technology uplift happening for us at the moment around our website. Um, and I was wondering, you know, for a lot of people, they might not understand what that what impact that's going to have on them. So could you maybe talk a bit about what that's going to mean for registered charities? Thanks, Andrew. Um, absolutely. Uh, so I know sometimes this isn't that I'm interested in the technology side of things, but it gets me very excited. Um, so um, what, what we're doing primarily is um, a security upgrade. So that primarily where um, you won't see much changes. There'll be a few little changes um, when you try and reset your passwords um, and um, so with, um, we're blocking certain passwords from people um, using them. So there's certain things that you'll see and it'll um, make it just a little bit more secure getting into your charity's portal. Um, but the probably most exciting part of our upgrade is we're improving the way the register's data is being um, shared. So we're introducing some reports that charities will be able to, um, charities, funders, policymakers will be able to access um, to get some real time um, information about um, what charities are reporting on. 
I know that there's a huge amount of work that charities put in every year when you have to file your annual return. And we're very conscious that's a lot of work. And there is a massive database of data that is accessed by policymakers um, and um, researchers and journalists. But it, it's it's really um, it's a really valuable piece of information, and we're conscious that right now you do need a, a fair amount of um, Excel knowledge to be able to navigate that data. And we want to make it easy for you to access. So that's that's the thing I'm probably most excited about with this upgrade. So that's something that we'll be releasing in the next few months. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, so uh, just wanted to let everyone know. Obviously, there are like we said, a ton of questions that came through. And so thank you so much to the Q&A panel for taking the time. But um, the questions that we didn't get, get to, we will theme them up afterwards and we will work out some really good answers so that we've covered off everything that you've asked here today. I also saw that um, we've got another question in chat about whether people can continue to email questions through to us. Absolutely, we're more than happy to answer any questions you have. Um, we would prefer that those come through to our info at charities.govt.nz inbox because that's where the first point of call for, for really any questions about being a registered charity. Um, so this has been, as I'm sure you are pretty aware, uh, a bit of a new experience for us running a digital annual meeting. So um, please just give us one word in the chat box to let us know how you found it. It's been really um, cool for us, but really interested in your experience. Um, so we are about to close this meeting. Uh, please get in touch if you have any questions about anything that's been discussed today or anything else that you want to know about being a registered charity in Aotearoa. Um, check out our website, charities.govt.nz. Subscribe to our newsletter for more updates. We send that out every couple of months. So our next one will be in December. Um, there's information, there's resources. You can um, get in touch with us any way that suits. So a final word from me. Um, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us here today. It's been really awesome uh, being on this call with all of you. It's it's really exciting to be able to do this, I guess, remotely. In a, you know, we're in this office down in uh, Wellington and we've got people from all over the country. So that's just really thrilling for us in a way that we, we don't often get to experience. So thank you so much for all of your time. Um, wherever you've joined us from, we really appreciate it. And I would just like to hand over back to Joe Buchanan to wrap up the meeting with a closing karakia. Ka kite. Kia ora, Andrew. Uh, kia ora te marino, kia whakapapa paunami te moana, hei huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i a tātou katoa.